There are many ways to run combat in Dungeons & Dragons. Some dungeon masters use erasable maps on battle mats. Some use pre-printed posters. Others use awesome Dwarven Forge terrains. Some will even use flat screens, TVs, somehow man mounted on a tabletop. Some don't use anything at all. We can group these combats into three large buckets. They're not perfect, but each has its use. Today, let's talk about combat in theater of the mind. The first bucket is a combat grid in which the characters and monsters are represented by tokens or minis on a five foot per square grid, or maybe a hex. I like hexes, but nobody agrees with me. So this grid could be physical, like uh, a poster map, or it could be something virtual. Even in the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's rules for running gridded combat uh, using several different options. The second bucket is an abstract map. Usually quick sketches, maybe done on a battle map or maybe just even on a little piece of paper. It might have even just X's and O's to represent where the baddies are or like coins, or you could even use miniatures. And the last one is the theater of the mind. Now this is a little bit more work for the DM and you have to use your words. In this, the DM describes the situation for the player, their intent, and the DM just judges the results, right? Set it up, let the players do what they're going to do, and a yay or nay, you can do this or you can't, and decide who gets hurt, who doesn't get hurt. This style is just completely narrative. We don't represent characters out with minis, no visual representations. Why? Why would we want to do this? Well, there's several reasons. The first is the cost. Holy shnikes! Minis are expensive. The cheap ones are like four bucks. If you want to go to Hero Forge and get a custom made one that perfectly represents what your character looks like, great. But I think the minimum price there is like 30, 35 bucks. Now, what if you're running Tomb of Annihilation and you go through like four or five characters? You spent a small fortune on this stuff. Not to mention, you're gonna feel peer pressured into painting it. It's just not worth it. Then, what about all those battle maps? Somebody's gotta buy those. If you're the DM, it sucks to be you, buddy. Are you gonna spend all that money to print out nice colored prints? You can't run down to Staples every week. And you don't want to be caught at the office stealing office supplies. The next is speed. There's no time to set up or tear down. So if you want to make an intense combat, uh, one where the players feel like they have to make snap decisions, theater of the mind is for you. So the flexibility. We can describe anything we can imagine. Uh, this is a great skill and takes a little practice for DMs. Just on the fly, hey, this is like this, that's like that. Don't feel nervous. Hey, I'm doing this right, I'm doing this wrong. Doesn't matter. The players just have to roll with it. Another reason is maintaining narrative flow. We don't have to break between scenes uh, to go from exploration to role playing to combat and back again. You just flow right from one to the other. So let's use some examples of playing in theater of the mind. Understanding what this kind of combat looks like can be a little bit difficult for players and DMs who are used to just running things on a grid. It's easy just to think like the other two pillars of D&D. &D. The DM describes the situation, the players describe what they want to do, and the DM is just like the umpire. He decides the result. It can be uh, as true for combat as it is for exploring and role play. Two examples of games that make heavy use of this. The first one was a game by Mike Merrills for the Founders League. It, he ran a three hour game for six level 18 characters. As you can imagine, it's no small feat. Challenging level 18 characters is really hard. And in doing so, it's an immense effort. 
The second game uh, is a recent Acquisitions Inc., uh, which was at the PAX West in September 2018. Chris Perkins, he used a really great house model for the adventures, but there's no miniatures in it and no distances are discussed during the combat. While they do have the model in front of them, it's mostly to suck your players into the world uh, to make them feel kind of like they want to live there, but it's not actively used for combat. Both of these games show how the story can shift going through the scene as things move on. In the middle of the battle, Omen Dran is banished to hell where he begins a negotiation with a pit fiend breaking from combat to interaction without any physical shift in the table. So let's do a quick summary for Theater of the Mind Combat. First of all, the DM should never be a competitor of the players, just an adjudicator for the story. Running the combat in Theater of the Mind requires trust. You need to work with the players, not against them. So don't let them feel as though things come out of a sudden, like, a uh, new round is up. Oh, all of a sudden, 15 orcs come from around the corner. Set it up. You could say a round or two before. Over all the noise from the combat, you hear footsteps running towards you in the distance. This lets the player know, hey, you got to do something quick or there's going to be more people in here. Help the players meet their intent. So when you're setting up the game, uh, or, or not even setting up the game, but setting up um, the player's turn in the combat, Ask them what they want to do and help them do it. So, okay, Bob, what is your dragonborn priest going to do? And they tell you. And you say, okay, well, uh, you would need this, this, and that. Great, they can do it. Start small. You want to run small battles in Theater of the Mind uh, to get used to the style. So let's say... Um, there's a pickpocket and he steals some magical item from one of your players, then darts down an alley. So you run after him and all of a sudden you're attacked by members of the thieves guild. That's a great time for theater of the mind because whoever the thief is continues to run. You just want to quick, quick, have your players deal with the people in front of them and see if they can catch that thief. Big boss battles, big complicated things. Okay, but work them up to it. Each turn, describe the situation from the point of view of the current character. Uh, Bob, as the beholder rises up, you see to your left, Emily is there bleeding. And Sam, oh man, Sam, he's got three mind flayers sucking out his brains. What do you want to do? In this way, the players feel like they have more agency. It's still their choice, and they can understand where things are. So in their minds, they're also creating their own battle map. Now, if things get a little bit confusing, you start getting a lot of enemies, or maybe if the players are trying to use some kind of crazy tactics, then, yeah, draw some quick diagrams. Uh, all you need is a little bit of scrap paper. Uh, if you want a battle map, that's fine. They're certainly reusable. So in most of these, uh, assume the enemies are within 25 feet of the characters and describe clearly when it's not. So you come up on a wall of orcs riding wargs. In the distance, you see uh, an orc in robes with glowing hands. Then characters can understand exactly what they're about. One of the issues with Theater of Their Mind is that D&D places a lot of very specific rules on how far away you are from a target to use an ability. So, you know, it's kind of fudgeable, but if you say, oh yeah, within 25 feet, all the spells that aren't touch are gonna hit, so it's no problem. Ask players to identify monsters by describing interesting physical characteristics of the monsters. This way, you really get them to do the work for you. Right, so let's say you're fighting some hill giants. Okay, Tammy, which hill giant are you gonna attack? And Tammy would be all like, oh, I'm gonna get the one with the lazy eye. Cool, that's the one you're on, Tammy. And then you could just keep track of 
which one that would want to be. Let's say there's three of them. Okay, that one's number two. Use evocative story descriptions to bring high fantasy to the battle. This is all about using all the fancy adjectives that people like Matt Mercer use when they talk. Get in on them. As you shove your dagger at the knoll, blood gushes out of his artery, spraying everywhere, covering your face. You can't see for a moment, but when you look back, he's down on one knee holding his neck. It's important to remember the role of the dungeon master. You are not a competitor to the player. It's not our goal to defeat the players. When we run D&D using a grid and map and miniatures, it's easy for us to forget this and start thinking like we're the adversaries, right? You got a chessboard, you got pieces on both sides, black fights white. This isn't the case. We're here to make people have, or not even make people, we're here to help people have fun. We facilitate storytelling and our job is to make the story as fun as possible and allow people to be heroes and do awesome things. It's important that we embrace it and define it for our players as much as possible. So thanks everyone for tuning in. If you think that combat of the mind might work for you, leave us a thumbs up, tell me how you used it, and maybe we'll include your story in a future episode. So if you could please click like, and if you like the content, subscribe, and we'll see you back again soon.